Welcome to Discover You, an inspiring podcast exploring cutting edge solutions to our everyday psychological challenges. We explore complex mental health issues and talk to professionals, experts, and renowned authorities at the forefront of transformative healing. Our mission is to educate and destigmatize, and to ultimately view mental health as a proactive quest for optimized living and equilibrium, rather than mere crisis intervention. Welcome to another episode of Discover You, our podcast exploring innovative solutions to issues in behavioral health. I'm J.D. Kalmanson, CEO of Montier Behavioral Health, a family of dynamic treatment centers in Southern California. I am truly honored to introduce you to our very special guest today, Roger Salman, PhD. As you will see from his bio, Roger is an expert in EMDR therapy, which is especially effective in treating complex trauma and PTSD. At Montier, our therapists are trained in EMDR, and we are big fans and proponents of this well-researched modality. I spoke with Roger about a month ago while he was literally in transit from Krakow, Poland to the Ukraine to work with war victims. For the first 15 to 20 minutes of our conversation, the audio on his cell phone was a bit rough, so I'm going to try and summarize some of the highlights. But before we get to that, here's a little bit of background on Dr. Salman. Dr. Salman is a psychologist specializing in trauma and grief. He is the program director and senior faculty with the EMDR Institute, an EMDR Europe approved trainer, and teaches EMDR therapy internationally. He is currently a consultant with the U.S. Senate and has provided services to numerous first responder agencies following traumatic incidents, including the FBI, the Secret Service, NASA, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the, US, and the United States Army. Along with teaching basic training in EMDR therapy workshops internationally, Dr. Salman presents workshops in the utilization of EMDR therapy with grief and mourning, complex trauma, and disassociative symptoms. Dr. Salman has authored 47 articles and book chapters pertaining to EMDR therapy, and he has authored a book just published in 2022 in Italian, translated Grief and EMDR from Diagnosis to clinical intervention. As you could see from this brief background summary, Dr. Salman knows his subject inside and out. EMDR is a therapeutic modality originating from a mentor of his, Francine Shapiro. Roger told us that she was walking in the park one day thinking about a disturbing memory. She noticed that after moving her eyes repetitively in a specific pattern, the memory of the disturbing event lost its punch and repeating the experiment a few times, she found that it worked every time. After more research, Francine discovered that the eye movement was actually helping the brain to reprocess the information in the traumatic event. Since EMDR helps stimulating the brain's innate information by reprocessing mechanisms, so the traumatic memories can be integrated more adaptively. Let me see if I can explain this as well as Roger did. It's fascinating. When something deeply painful and overwhelming happens, that memory becomes so distressful that in the brain we have two sections, generally speaking. The section of past in which we're able to take certain experiences and archive them and relegate them to the past. But sometimes when a memory is so traumatic and painful and overwhelming, it sort of gets frozen in time, stuck in our brains as it were, and never ends up being placed in the past category in the archives. And having this memory sort of stuck and lurking there will allow it to fester and pester and it will inhibit us because it has not been placed in the past and therefore the lines between past and present are blurred so that it has a detrimental impact on our wellness, on our emotional equilibrium. And through the eye movement techniques and auditory tones used in EMDR, the brain's innate information processing mechanism can be stimulated and it can allow the brain to form an adaptive resolution and finally place it in the past section and archive it properly. I asked Dr. Salman whether EMDR could be done 
by yourself. Because on the surface, the techniques utilized in EMDR seem pretty simple and straightforward. And so it would make sense for that the average individual might, after learning it, be able to do it on themselves. His response was a very clear no. It is vital for somebody to work with a licensed therapist who's been trained properly in EMDR therapy. Because even though it appears simple, there is a lot more to it. A lot of emotions may come up and a person can get stuck somewhere in those emotions or some other buried memory could emerge that would be overwhelming for somebody to deal with alone. I asked him what a typical EMDR session looks like. And it seems that it's very similar to a traditional therapeutic session in which the therapist would create rapport, would provide some psychosocial education. And in EMDR, the therapist and the client would work together to select a memory to begin dealing and doing the EMDR therapy with, which made a lot of sense for me because even for a client or a patient to select a certain memory, to identify that this memory is what is leading to so much anxiety, for example, or a lack of confidence or so much depression, even to be able to identify that memory, one would need the help of a professional licensed therapist who would help us sort of work through a lot of the emotional fog to be able to pull that memory out there and reprocess it. I also learned in our conversation that EMDR can be applied more broadly than I had realized before. According to Roger, EMDR's efficacy in treating a wide variety of psychological disorders has been validated by a lot of research. It can treat the very painful experiences like big T trauma, a catastrophic event, a fire, or something else that was, that's incredibly overwhelming and painful. But it also is effective with little t trauma. For example, the repetitive angry look of a mother when we are growing up as a child, which though it may seem minor, could be very detrimentally impactful over time creating feelings of I'm not good enough or I don't belong or there's something wrong with me. Those self-esteem issues don't come from these big major big T trauma but from a series of small traumas giving us the sense of rejection, blame or humiliation. And EMDR therapy protocols Roger was sharing are helpful for these memories as well. Things that are distressing and have long-term residual harm if we were to go through the EMDR protocols and identify those memories and process them with the maturity and the insight of being able to recognize that this should not make me feel any less beautiful, valuable. I was a child and the, com the emotional context that surrounds those memories really helps us neurologically store them in the brain, not only in the past archives, but also in a way that is free from a lot of the heaviness and the negative toxicity that we may have originally processed those memories when the experiences happened to us as a child. That idea was incredibly counterintuitive to me. At this point, we're going to join the live conversation because I think you'll be able to hear Roger's voice clearly. I hope you enjoy it. And we're going to begin where I'm reacting to Roger's description of how EMDR can treat these entrenched lifelong patterns of low self-esteem. It just seems so counterintuitive that something which is predicated on helping us process memories could also be effective when you're dealing with potentially hundreds or thousands of memories that have contributed to a certain self-image, to a certain orientation. And that's, it's, it's mind-boggling that EMDR, and I guess that's, that's, that's why EMDR is probably not a one-time session, but it, is an, it can be an ongoing journey to really try and address this plethora, this huge volume of memories and process it in a healthy way and allow it to be put in the past. Um, exactly, that's why EMDR is very efficient but it's not necessarily a, a, a shortcut. For simple trauma uh, or single episode trauma, research has shown that maybe one to three sessions 
uh, may be sufficient to, to eliminate PTSD symptoms. But when we're talking about a childhood full of negative memories, negative attachment memories, of course, a higher dose is going to be needed. And certainly when we're talking about complex trauma and dissociative disorder, then EMDR therapy, along with a variety of different methodologies, is, is going to be needed. That's amazing. And it's just so important to, to um, you know, identify the basic mechanism of what you're describing here is that for us to be traumatized by a certain event, we have to have allowed that event or that episode or that relationship to gain a certain measure of control over us. And the real mechanism of how it gains control over us is when the memory of that event is lodged and stuck somewhere in our brain. So that's when it really cripples with our functionality and it sort of paralyzes us to perpetually be experiencing that pain to a certain degree and not allowing ourselves to move past it. But what's amazing is that we naturally have the gift of moving past things and not being traumatized, except when something like this happens, when this memory becomes just so painful and something uh, non-organic or not natural happens and the memory isn't processed and it sort of gets stuck there. Yeah, that is correct. And it gets, and, and talking therapy, talk therapy is usually not sufficient. It does, talking does not get to the part of the brain where that trauma is stored. And yes, what happens is something happens, uh, an event occurs that's beyond the integrative capacity of the person. So it indeed gets stuck and gets triggered and plagues the person. So, it's it's there is there is trauma therapy that is available that can help a person through these traumatic experiences right and when these traumatic experiences get processed uh they get stored in an adaptive way and that helps guide uh, adaptive future behavior i mean from the perspective of let's just if we unpack the word memory for a moment it's not as if after somebody goes through an emdr session they're forgetting that experience this is so so what's really happening is that it seems from what I'm understanding, from what you're saying, that the memories have different compartments in the brain where they can be stored. And unless they're processed and stored in a compartment, which will, for, the, for you know, simplistic purposes, will label past, unless we put them in the past category, which helps us compartmentalize them, they're going to be sort of stuck or frozen or lurking in the present category. And that is what's really disrupting our equilibrium and not allowing us to move on, right? So it's not the memory itself, it's where the memory resides in the brain. Yes, and you use some very nice metaphors on that because the past memory is still present. It's like there can be the memory is stored in a way that it's not over for the person. It's like it continues. Right. It's not over. Right. I mean, when we talk about grief and mourning, and I know that this is something that's a major part of your work, and it seems to be effective, uh, it, you know, is there any limitations? Are there restrictions? Why isn't it as widespread as Tylenol in terms of dealing with grief and mourning? Well, that's a good question. Well, first of all, I think it it, it uh, may be more widely utilized with grief and mourning than we realize, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of EMDR therapists. But it may be that a lot of uh, EMDR therapists uh, may not be aware of how it can be applied to to grief and mourning. Certainly, the loss of a person is a traumatic event. And we can go in and use, utilize EMDR therapy with a loss, starting with the, uh, the ground zero, maybe when the loss began. Mm -hmm. And now what happens when we do EMDR with grief and mourning, we can process the trauma of the loss. And then what starts to happen when a person can realize that the person is gone, not coming back and deal with the pain of that, then adaptive information can start to link in. And usually this is in the form of positive, meaningful 
memories that form an adaptive inner representation. In other words, good grief is when we think of our loved one and we experience the joyful, meaningful memories and the meaning of that person in our life. Right. And we carry that with us. Right. So EMDR can facilitate the formation of this adaptive inner representation. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And, you know, it, it, I don't know if this is directly connected, but it just is an idea that uh, sprung up while you were talking. I mean, it, as long as we have the association and the relationship with the deceased in uh, the, the arena and the domain of the brain as being in the present, the fact that we can't see them and the fact that we can't talk to them makes it all the more painful. There's this interesting, um, you know, sort of Talmudic expression that you, you will never be able to properly mourn and grieve over somebody who's still alive, even if you don't, if you think someone's dead, but they're really alive, you'll never be able to go through the mourning process and find acceptance because they are alive. They really are in the present. I think the same thing in a similar way is with the memory I get from what I'm hearing until you properly store it and process it, only then can the next phase of acceptance and, and, and reintegrating the positive memories and the affectionate and endearing ones and allow that to replace the pain. Yes, well said, Rabbi. However, sometimes the person who died, well, it can be bittersweet. There can also be negative memories associated with the deceased. Mm -hmm. And of course, EMDR therapy can be used to process these memories as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I mean, I understand you work in some very extreme conditions, whether it's with the Senate, NASA, the Army, the FBI. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do with those organizations? I imagine those folks can deal with, uh, you know, dealing with heavy trauma. Our first responders are uh, exposed to terrible traumas. They have to be not only risk their life, but they're witness to other people's traumas as well. And being human beings, this can certainly take a toll on them. So it's, it was uh, certainly been a wonderful part of my career, starting actually in the 70s as a graduate student to start understanding trauma and working with uh, friends and colleagues, starting to build programs for first responders, and including the you know, agencies that you, uh, you talked about. So that there are, when there is some kind of a critical incident, there are now programs to help our first responders deal with the trauma. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I mean, it's, a, it's, 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 it's such an incredible blessing that you can provide healing in that way to such extreme you know, incidents. EMDR as a whole, let's go back just for a second, is so well researched. I mean, it's recommended as an effective treatment for trauma PTSD by the American <coughs> Psychiatric Association and the Departments of Defense and the VA. Could you share any of the high-level data on the efficacy of the treatment? What's the success rate? I mean, and even on a broader level, how do you define success? So there are a number of studies that have shown EMDR to be effective, studies that go out for one year. And there's also been randomly controlled studies comparing EMDR with wait lists over some other therapies that have shown its efficacy as well. So, uh, and more and more EMDR is being researched for a variety of disorders. For example, more and more data is coming in on depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. And there's also research now on how EMDR can be part of the treatment with psychotic disorders because people for example, that suffer from schizophrenia may also have traumatic events, which can be dealt with with EMDR therapy. That's so interesting. I mean, there's, um, I'm sure you've, you're familiar with MDMA, right? Yes. Now, what, one of the fascinating things about MDMA is that it reduces the amygdala and allows people after the dose to really open up and access memories that they've consciously suppressed because of how painful and how overwhelming that memory would be if they were to process it in a regular conscious manner. So they're, 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 they take eight hours and they just tap into certain memories that th otherwise they wouldn't even necessarily be aware of. Um, I mean, it's not, not similar to hypnosis, but uh, the, the result is sort of similar where 
the communi- the content that gets communicated is things that afterwards they listen to it and they're surprised. The reason I bring this up is because if EMDR is predicated on properly processing a certain memory that's painful, a prerequisite to processing that memory in a session would be to be able to identify that memory. And it would therefore seem that all memories that we're not consciously accessing because of how painful they might be, that we suppressed them so many years ago, or that we've simply forgotten, even though how it would be impossible to forget something so painful, but ne- nevertheless is not consciously accessible to us, I'm just wondering if EMDR in conjunction with something else that helps tap into those inaccess- consciously inaccessible memories would really have like a, a compounded incredible therapeutic effect. I think the potential is, is, is there, and research needs to be done. Uh, there's already some uh, therapies that have been combined with MDMA and have had some successful results. And uh, I have heard that some research is going on with the MDR therapy as well. But, but uh, again, there needs to be research. But theoretically, as you talk about, certainly the, these two different methods can enhance each other. Right, because if you, you can only deal with a memory that you can consciously access, right? How, how, unless and EMDR, stay present with. Right, right, right. So, you have to access it and be able to stay present with it. That's true. Right, right. I mean, with talking about memories and early childhood memories, when there's trauma, we all know that a person's sense of safety is often uh, feels threatened. Have you noticed in your work that early childhood attachment difficulties come up in the EMDR treatment? Do attachment disorders have a direct effect on how dysregulated or traumatized the client can become? Absolutely, and the the more I do the work that I do, the more that I see how important it is to get to these early attachment memories. Hmm. Because, you know, beginning with Freud, who first you know, pointed out the relationship between problems and, and what happened in childhood. Now there's a lot of research on, on uh, the, the attachment relationship between the child and the caregiver. So certainly with EMDR therapy, it's important that, you know, can be important to get to these early childhood memories. So I do a lot of work um, on attachment and certainly there's research that shows that disorganized attachment underlies complex trauma and dissociative disorders so a very important part of treatment including emdr treatment is not only processing adult trauma but also being able to get to the underlying attachment memories having to do with the child and the caregiver mm-hmm. so there's other frameworks that may be involved in uh guiding EMDR therapy, but once we're able to get to an early memory, EMDR therapy can indeed be helpful. Also, we may start with a memory that happened at age, uh, you know, five or six that the person remembers, and it can start to evoke earlier material in the form of feelings, sensations, non, you know, nonverbal ways. That's amazing. So it could have a it could have a domino effect, meaning to say once we properly process some of the the the, the more recent painful memories that have been lodged and sort of stored, and now that they've been put aside and processed in a healthy way, we can then avail ourselves to some of the earlier memories that were painful that we weren't even, you know, equipped to deal with. But right now that's gonna be coming up. So it's 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 a it's a process, it's a journey. That's that's correct. It's very important that these early childhood attachment memories be dealt with. And EMDR therapy is effective with the big T trauma, your tsunamis, your bank robberies, assaults. But it also is very helpful for these childhood memories. So certainly in a lot of my work with dissociative disorders and complex trauma, we're not only dealing with with the childhood traumas that they remember, but also... The attachment memories, the the neglect, the humiliation, and the big one is being alone. Hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Y- yes. Well, loneliness is is very pervasive in the world, and it's, in childhood, when there's humiliation or there's shame, 
or, or neglect or, or abuse, the child often has to go through it alone. And as a child, uh, I'm alone can lead to a sense of what's called annihilation anxiety. I'm alone can be worse than I'm going to die. It's like I'm, I'm invisible. I'm not seeing. I'm going to disintegrate. It can really be too much. So, and let's keep in mind that when there is criticism or there is abuse or there is neglect, there's not, uh, or beatings, there's not only what happened to the child or what didn't happen to the child like comfort, but the child's alone with it. And we're wired to seek comfort from uh, caregivers. And when that comfort is not there, that's that's when there can be that sense of I'm alone, I'm not safe, there's something wrong with me, and I'm powerless. I totally understand how putting the memory aside and processing it will finally allow us some closure and for that memory to, 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 to cease taunting us or haunting us. But as far as, let's just say, what all those positive social support systems would do for us as far as character development, what love, what positive relationships, what confidence, what empowerment, validation, and affirmation would do for us. EMDR is not seeking to circumvent that and say this is going to solve all the absence of all of those positive attributes that would have come about had you had a healthy household and a, and a good family unit of support. It, right? It's not seeking to to, to sort of proactively give us all of those, you know, social uh, forms of capital. It's rather just seeking to, I guess, uh, diminish and restrict what the negative memories would be doing as far as trauma. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. You know, of, of course, it's, it's psychotherapy in present time isn't totally going to make up everything that happened in childhood, but with the therapeutic, with the therapeutic relationship, you know, which is very important, that uh, uh, provides a different kind of relationship than the person had a child, along with you know, reprocessing, the, reprocessing the more negative memories, big ones and small ones, helps the person develop a sense of efficacy in today's life, increases their self-esteem, and this is going to increase their uh, ability to find joy in relationships as well. So that's right. the big three, the big three symptoms are affect regulation, self-esteem, and relationships. And yes, the early childhood trauma, you know, certainly disrupts all three realms. So we can make a difference yeah. and for your listeners that are out there that as you say we're not going to create not going to make up for a happy childhood but life can be better there there is help there is hope self-esteem your sense of efficacy and relationships can get better that's beautiful and that's and that's and that's so evident in your trip right now as you're entering the Ukrainian border and you're going to work with war victims. I mean, this trauma that they're experiencing is so fresh, is so recent. How much time has to lapse if, uh, you know, before the EMDR is effective? Is there any time frame and when it's optimal to treat that type of a memory with EMDR, even if it's only yesterday or a week ago? Well, EMDR therapy has really evolved. There are now a number of recent event protocols to help people who've been distressed uh, or, or the traumas occurred you know, yesterday or last week. Also, not only can we do it individually, but there are group protocols, protocols that can be offered relief. And these have been widely applied in the Ukraine. There, there's been a lot of support from so many different uh, countries, you know, training and, and also providing direct clinical services over the internet. And uh, what I'm going to be doing in Lviv is training 
the new EMDR therapist and also providing some advanced training on complex trauma dissociation, where I certainly will teach the importance of attachment, understanding these, uh, these negative attachment relationships and how to work with complex trauma with EMDR therapy. And yes, I will be doing some direct clinical work with people suffering from trauma. That's, that's unreal. It's an amazing thing that you're doing, and uh, I hope you stay safe. And it's it's just it's extraordinary when you train all those folks out there. The compounding effect of how many people will be healed in the process is immeasurable. That's an incredible thing. Um, just last last question, but not least, can you give us a two minute description of the protocols of what a session might look like? And I do understand that there's so many variations of EMDR. So I guess what would be the protocols of the most standard form of it? Sure. Well, after history taking and preparation, what will be done is to identify the memory to, re to reprocess and we access it. We're going to ask you what image represents the worst part. We will get that also access and identify the negative self belief one has, the meaning to the self. I'm not good enough. I'm not safe. I'm powerless. And then we identify a goal, a therapeutic goal, an adaptive, positive cognition, we call it. I am safe. I have control. I have you know, some control. I am good enough. And we take a measure. How true do the words I'm safe today feel to you on a one to seven scale, one false, seven true? And in the beginning, well, my head knows it's true. It's a seven. But in my gut, so oh, it feels like a two. We all know people that know, that tell you, I know it's not my fault, but inside it feels like it is. So again, we have that image, that negative cognition, positive cognition. Then we get the emotion. And then we ask the person, how disturbing is it? Zero, which is calm, 10 the worst. And where do you feel in your body? So we're accessing that memory. Then we ask the person, think of the memory while we do the bilateral stimulation for 20, 30 seconds. And the therapist, for the most part, stays out of the way, will do, because you know what's happening is we're stimulating the brain's information processing system, and it's a very natural, organic uh, you know, approach. So after 20, 30 seconds of bilateral stimulation, we'll ask you, what do you notice now? And what happens with EMDR therapy is there's a chain of associations other thoughts, other emotions, other memories start to come on up. This is the organic healing process. So the therapist will just say, go with that or stay with that. So this is the sensitization phase where we're doing these sets of bilateral stimulation and we measure the effect by that zero to 10 scale. And the goal is that it's zero or calm. Now, zero is not the absence of emotion. And zero doesn't mean you feel good about it. Zero means you can think about it with embodies call. Not that everything will go to zero. We're not going to take away appropriate emotions. Mm -hmm. So that's the desensitization phase. Next is the, we call it the insulation phase. So remember I talked about that positive cognition. I'm safe. I'm good enough. I have some control. So now we bring up the memory and we pair it with that positive cognition. And we continue doing the bilateral stimulation, measuring the effects on that one to seven scale. And so the goal is for the person to be able to bring up the memory with that positive cognition. I'm safe today or I have some control or I'm a good person. I am lovable. And the bring up that memory and to feel it's true in the body. So in this way, EMDR therapy is a paradigm of resilience, but we're not done yet. What we're going to do is a body scan, bring up that memory and that positive cognition. I'm safe today, for example, and scan your body. Let me know if there's any tension or tightness, unusual sensation. And uh, if there is, we'll continue to process it. Then we have closure. We want to make sure the person is grounded at the end of the session. As 
the scene Shapiro put it, we want to be sure the person can go out into the real world and, and deal with uh, handle heavy machinery. And we explain to the person that other memories, thoughts, emotions may come on and up. In other words, the processing can continue. It's like scraping out uh, a beaver dam. Water starts to flow. Things may come on up. And we also talk to the person, teach the person how to calm themselves in procedures and uh, techniques and imagery that can be used to calm, to calm oneself. Then the last phase is re-evaluation. At the next session, we have the person bring up the memory. We see if the treatment effects have maintained. And also we, we ask what else has come on up and we go from there. I love that. I absolutely love that. You know, in the Hebrew language, I'll just conclude, there's certain terms that are very often interchangeable. Thou shall not forget and that you should remember. And it always struck me that they seem to be repeating the same thing. If you don't forget, then you're remembering. If you're remembering, then you're not forgetting. But then it occurred to me that they're actually very different from each other. You can only remember that which you have forgotten. When we say don't forget, we're saying never release that memory to begin with. Because remembering would presuppose that you released it, you forgot it, and now you're re-engaging with it. And I love how there's a duality of what you're describing with the EMDR, that on the one hand, we want to allow the negative, painful experiences and memories to be forgotten, to be stored, to find closure, to be processed, and to be released from their toxic ram uh, implications and stranglehold on our wellness and equilibrium. And then the positive cognition, the memory, the identity, the perception of all the po all the all the strong character assets that we have that make us special and beautiful and valuable and unique we never want to forget that we want to bolster that and that's really that becomes the source of the resiliency so that's a, that's, that's a it's a beautiful duality and effusion that's going on here thank you so much roger yep. this has been such an amazing amazing experience to hear this insight and the work that you do so enlightening I, I just truly wish we have the opportunity again um, when things are a little calmer and the world is a little safer and uh, you're a little less busy. Okay, and, indeed. Uh, indeed. I'd be happy to elaborate on it and, yes. and uh, maybe uh, uh, show you, even be able to show you a video. I would love but that. Rabbi, I, I very much enjoyed our, our conversation. You have a good grasp and insight on the therapeutic process. Thank you so much for what you do. And those who are listening, thank you very much for, for listening. Of course. Thank you. And much so much success with your mission, with your holy mission. And uh, really, stay safe. And thank you to our audience for joining us, too. I hope you've learned something from today's episode of Discover You and that it enriches your life. At Montier, we want you to know that you're not alone on your journey. And to find out more about our programs, you can always find us on the web, MontierBehavioralHealth.com. And you can listen to this podcast, Discover You, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Wishing all of you thriving health and a safe and truly fulfilling day. See you next time.